welcome everyone who came here tonight. We are so fortunate to have Mr. John M. LaForge, who is part of Nuke Watch, and I encourage all of you to join Nuke Watch. So anyway, welcome everyone. We're very fortunate that tonight we have one of the a main representatives of Nuke Watch, which is such a good organization, and encourage all of us to join and get their newsletter. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the evening. Uh, Victor's going to play Masters of War, remembering that Bob Dylan won the Literature Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> our boy from Duluth, where our guest speaker is also from, was you were you were born there too, like Bob Dylan. <laughs> Right. Without further ado, I'll, then I'll just tell you that Cecile is going to introduce John, and then John will do the program. But meanwhile, Victor, our, uh, who's a member of our Social Justice Committee. Yes, Bob Dylan got the uh, Nobel Peace Prize for uh, English Literature, and that's something that all folk singers are celebrating. All Probably the whole rock and roll community is glad to have that kind of uh, recognition for such a great poet of our uh, of our times and this song is appropriate for tonight it's called masters of war it's the version i do on my new cd coming out and i have a great violin player on there named eric golub so that'll be out in a couple weeks come you masters of war you that build all the guns You that build the death planes You that build all the bombs You that hide behind walls You that hide behind desks We just want you to know we can see through your masks You'd have never done nothing but build to destroy. You play with our world like it's your little toy. You put a gun in my head and you hide from my eyes. Then you turn and run farther when the fast bullets fly. Judas of old, he lie and deceive. The world war can be won. You want me to believe, but I see through your eyes and I see through your brain. Like I see through the water that runs down the drain. Fasten the triggers for the others to fire. And just sit back and watch as the death count gets higher. You hide in your mansion as the young people's blood. Out of their bodies and is buried in the mud. You've thrown the worst fear that could ever be hurled. The fear to bring children into this crazy world. For threaten our babies, unborn and unnamed. You're not worth the blood that flows in your veins. Come, you masters of terror. You that build the death guns. You that build the drone planes. You that drop all the bombs. I pledge with my heart and I pledge with my mind. 
to help make the history that leaves you behind. Bob Dylan, Masters of War. Thank you very much. We're going to bring Cecile up. We're going to stop this stuff. It kills fascists. Welcome, welcome everybody. It is such a great pleasure to see you all here tonight. Many familiar faces. I'm very grateful to VFUU for sponsoring this event for John LaForge. I met John when I toured the Great Lakes states, uh, flagging this book and talking about the nuclear industry. And, uh, and he and Bonnie at Nuke Watch gave me one day off. And it was the most exquisite day, probably, of my entire tour, uh, and, and then some, because there was three feet of snow, a full moon, and I got to walk in it. And there were no city lights to pollute the, the sky. So I've written about it, actually. It's, it's in my whale book. So let me introduce John. It gives me such pleasure to welcome you. John LaForge has worked on the staff of Newt Watch, a peace and environmental action group in Wisconsin since 1992, and edits its quarterly newsletter. John is a regular contributor to Counterpunch and Peace Voice, and his articles on nuclear power and weapons and militarism have appeared in The Ecologist, New Internationalist, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the Miami Herald, and elsewhere. Much of the public, that's us, mistakenly believes that U.S. nuclear weapons went away after the collapse of the USSR and the Cold War. This belief is promoted by the creation across the country of Cold War monuments and memorials like the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site in South Dakota, where John spoke September the 30th, which treat the U.S. nuclear arsenal like a thing of the past. Nuclear Heartland exposes and confronts this mythology, and that's the book that John's going to be talking about tonight. He just edited it. It's, it's a new edition uh, following the 1988 edition, and compels readers to face factual nuclear reality. Dr. Helen Caldicott says, Nuclear Heartland is one of the most frightening books that I have ever read. The U.S. Navy and Air Force and the numerous corporations, including Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and others who make the monstrous weapons of mass destruction documented in Nuclear Heartland Revised, are the real terrorists of our age. If you... Google Nuke Watch, the Nuke Watch website, you will find a button where you can purchase more copies of the book he'll be talking about tonight, Nuclear Heartland. Also, you can sign a petition there demanding that Congress draw down the 450 nuclear armed missiles spread throughout Montana, North Dakota, Colorado, and elsewhere. John and his, and his colleague, Barb Catt, are perhaps the only people ever to have visited all 1,000 land-based intercontinental ballistic missile sites still kept on hair-trigger alert. Today, there are still 450. In 1984, Barb, along with John, entered a Sperry plant and began hammering at the computers, disabling them. For this and similar capers, John has served... Uh, enough hard time to be permanently vested in the U.S. incarceration because we don't like you system. Give him a hand. Uh, thanks very much, Cecile. And thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. I want to make a short announcement before I launch into my uh, talk on the book. Um, uh, accompanied on this tour with my friend Marion Kupker from Germany, who's uh, part of an international campaign to permanently remove U.S. nuclear weapons from Germany. Uh, most U.S. citizens don't even know that the U.S. is the only country in the world that deploys its nuclear weapons in other states. We have about 180 so-called B-61 gravity bombs 
in five NATO partners in Europe, Italy, Turkey, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. And uh, the Europeans want them out of there, Germany in particular, and uh, Marion and her group have fought for 20 years to have them removed from the Buschel Air Force Base where German fighter pilots train on their tornado jets to deliver these nuclear weapons upon the order of U.S. President and the NATO command. And now with these, the saber rattling and the craziness going on in Syria between the U.S. and Russia, these weapons are more destabilizing and dangerous than ever. There's between 50 and 90 at the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey, which you may recall was the headquarters of the failed coup back in July. The entire chain of command at that base has been placed under arrest. And U.S. has 50, at least 50 of these Cold War era gravity bombs there. 20 in Germany, maybe 80 in Italy. They're spread around. Well, they need to come home. Marion has a declaration of solidarity with the German movement to get those weapons returned. So please uh, take the time to sign this declaration of solidarity before you leave tonight. As Cecile pointed out, uh, I think Barb Cat, my former partner, and I are the only people to have visited all 1,000 land-based silos when there were 1,000. Uh, it was a sobering experience, as you can imagine. 30,000 miles in the winter of 1988 to uh, chart the location of all those 450 red dots, each one a Minuteman missile, and the other 550 that at the time were still deployed. Nukwatch took that project on uh, under the inspiration of the late Sam Day, our mastermind and founder in Madison, Wisconsin. We've done a lot of other anti-nuclear investigation and action over the past 35 years. We've brought critical attention to truck transports of nuclear weapons, rail shipments of high-level radioactive waste, the use of plutonium batteries, on risky space shots like the Cassini space probe you may have heard of, as well as the dumping of radioactive waste in Lake Superior and the, and the sea, and as well as uh, protesting the use of uranium and ammunition used in, by uh, the United States in great volume, so-called depleted uranium weapons. We report on these and other nuclear issues in our quarterly newsletter, which is available for free in the back. It's called Nuke Watch Quarterly. Well, by discussing uh, Nuclear Heartland, our new edition of it, um, there's the cover in the back where Helen Caldercott gave us her great blurb, along with, uh, oh, Kathy Kelly. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? She also wrote a nice blurb for us, and she borrowed a phrase from another anti-war activist who called these weapons, which are placed deep in the ground, razor blades in a loaf of bread. It's a nice image to think of uh, because this is the breadbasket of the country that, where these weapons have been deployed. By discussing this new edition, I'll present its principal message that the land-based missile system can and must be permanently eliminated. Uh, with that, we can all help to see that it is, that the system is redundant, accident-prone, provocative, and vulnerable, and have has lately been found riddled with corruption. As this slide uh, makes clear, there used to be, as I said, a thousand of these land-based missiles. Some were Minuteman II rockets, others were Minuteman III. Uh, the pink dots in uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Missouri, those are the missiles that have been removed since 1988. Uh, we like to take some credit for the removal of those particular missiles because after the publication of the uh, original Nuclear Heartland, um, a lot of protest was generated uh, because people, for the first time, had directions and maps of where these were and realized they're very approachable, unlike other nuclear weapons in the U.S., such as the submarine weapons. They're deep inside submarine bases. You can't get near them or the ones on heavy bombers, they're deep inside Air Force bases and you can't approach them. But these weapons are behind simple old chain link fences and all you see above ground is a concrete slab. You'll see a picture in a minute. 
and uh, any and everybody can walk right up to them, which we did dozens of times during our research. What we like to take credit for is the uh, generation of all these protests that took place throughout the 80s and 90s, and um, in part, the publication of these maps brought this about. Also, the fact is that three major population centers, as you can see, Grand Forks, North Dakota in the north, Rapid City, South Dakota, right near the South Dakota field, and then Kansas City, Missouri, in Missouri. Major population centers produced big and consistent and robust protests of these particular missiles. Those are the ones that were removed. So we like to just encourage people to get out there, raise some hell, and keep calling attention to the ones that are left. As you can see, there are a lot left. Uh, this is the corner of Nebraska, Colorado, and Wyoming. This field of 150 missiles is operated by the F.E. Warren Air Force Base, one of the most corruption-ridden bases in the country. Now, I'll explain a little about that later, but you may have seen uh, reports in the regular papers about drug distribution, cheating on proficiency exams, and then the uh, chain of command at the base being removed for all this, as well as accidents with some of the missiles. The North Dakota field, the one that remains, almost encircles the city of Minot. We put a picture of one of these missiles on the cover because of the Soros River that flooded, forcing the evacuation of Minot, a city of 12,000 people, in 2011, and flooding a lot of these missiles that were underground and quite vulnerable to this 500-year flood, which wasn't supposed to happen. In Montana, and around Great Falls, uh, another 150 missiles. And you can see these little red outlines. They demark a flight of 10 missiles and one launch control center. Uh, the LCC is where the uh, Air Force crews work underground uh, at the ready to take a presidential order if it comes to launch those 10 missiles. There's 10 in each of the flights, and the launch center is always the number one. Uh, we did this work in the winter time when we did the original driving research to each and every one, and we, it was over the holiday times, and uh, one of the launch control centers was decorated with Christmas lights. That could have been the most ironic thing we saw. Uh, you know, praise Jesus and pass the ammunition, maybe. Well, the other thing that the book brought attention to was how near, I mean, besides the size, the enormous size of the nuclear weapons arsenal, how near it is to regular households. We reproduced many of the same photographs from the original book in the new edition and added quite a few new photographs from uh, more recent research. This is from the original book. Over these last 35 years, they've made these things more accurate, more useful in the event of a war. And uh, they also have downsized the size of the warheads in accordance to START treaties that have taken place over the years. But uh, the so-called downsizing of the weapons is a little bit deceptive. Oh, here's an example of, uh, as I said earlier, how approachable these weapons are. You can see the concrete lid in the back at the top of the, by the horizon line. But here's a group of about 200 Mennonites that came into North Dakota for a demonstration. Uh, Nuke Watch and other groups organized uh, enough people to entirely encircle this missile that afternoon, something that was quite alarming to the Air Force. Not because we posed any danger to this 100-ton concrete lid over the missile, but because it's bad PR. And it proves again and again that these things can't foil even the simplest approach, a much less Soviet saboteurs, which supposedly the fences are designed to foil. This missile silo was left wide open all weekend, unattended, in 1988. Sunday afternoon, Barb and I found this and took these photographs. You know, any, anybody with a bucket of concrete or some super glue or a truckload of gravel, to say nothing of an improvised explosive device, say, could completely destroy this launch site. Again, uh, proving this, there was no Soviet threat. That was hyped worse then than the terrorist threat is today, I would say. Again, uh, the fences are easy to climb. Nowadays, you'd call this uh, taking a selfie. Uh, we did this over and over again. That's Barb and me back in 1988. Well, what I was saying about the Miniman 2 um, is significant. The Miniman 2 had a single warhead, but it was enormous. It was a million 200,000 tons of TNT equivalent, 1.2 megatons 
of explosive power. It's actually rather hard to conceive of a comparison, but one of the interpreters at the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site told me he'd done a little math on his own, and when he takes tours, tour groups through this site now, he tells them, he says, 1.2 million tons of TNT would fill up a train car, a coal train, that's 350 miles long. I think that, that was the best analogy I've seen for a long time. It's a grabby figure. It gives you an idea of how much explosive power that is. Normally, you see a coal train that's one mile long. It takes a long time for it to go by your street. So those giant warheads were replaced with much more reasonable and moderate warheads. These three per missile were 300 or are 335 kilotons. So you still end up with a megaton of power. It's just divided by three, and each warhead can go to a different city or military base or missile site. It's called independently targeted reentry vehicles. Don't call it a massacre at, at all costs. So these 335 kiloton warheads are roughly 20 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. That bomb destroyed seven square miles and turned 140,000 people to powder and ash. Uh, by comparison, then, back in 1988, the 1,000 missiles that the U.S. had with their monstrous warheads could have killed, all else being equal, 7.5 billion people and flattened 100,000 square miles. Uh, today's more reasonable and moderate and measured small war nuclear warheads, as I said, are 335 kilotons. They can individually all else being equal, kill 2.8 million people and destroy 51 square miles. That's roughly the size and population of the city of Chicago. Chicago has 2.6 million. Well, people who've considered these weapons like you all in this room over the course of a lifetime, I don't think you need to be reminded that all they can produce if they're used in warfare is a massacre. Uh, the people then who work on these weapons and maintain them and keep them shiny and polished like this engineer from Boeing, they have to uh, deny what they're doing during the day and, or else couch it in certain psychological terms that pr provide them the uh, ease and comfort to continue working on them. Uh, the psychologist and the Yale professor Robert Lifton called it psychic numbing. Uh, I, I like to call it optimistic myth-making uh, in which... Nuclear weapons are imbued with a power and an influence that they don't really have. They're thought to be imbued with an ethical value and a practical purpose, which is mythological. But it allows these weapons workers to continue preparing for deliberate, indiscriminate destruction that is actually uncontrollable, unthinkable, and unlawful. Well, this myth-making was on full display at a ceremony presided over by Colonel Edward Rausch in North Dakota in June of 1998. They said goodbye to the last Minuteman II missile uh, after having maintained them for 34 years. Where, and the colonel said, ICBM stood for this period of time as a deterrent to any adversary in the world that might consider challenging the peace and freedom that we enjoy. Though this deterrence claim is common knowledge, say, in the school system and the culture at large, it ignores and denies hundreds of attacks on our wartime so-called peace and freedom, to name a few attacks that could not and couldn't ever have been deterred by nuclear weapons or these missiles in particular, the 1970 hijacking of the Eastern Airlines flight, the 1979 Iran hostage crisis, the 1983 Marine barracks bombing in Beirut, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. People might remember that the subway system was bombed then uh, under the WTC. The 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, the 2000 bombing of the USS Cole, of course the official version of 9-11, the Boston Marathon bombing, and dozens of other terrorist attacks that prove that these weapons don't deter attacks on us. So-called nuclear deterrence is repeatedly debunked by these attacks, but it's still the official public rationale for our nuclear weapons. Deterrence, as such, is easily debunked and firmly believed in. The situation recalls Mark Twain's dictum. He said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Well, another principal myth of the nuclear age 
was repeated by Colonel Rausch at the goodbye ceremony. He said, because of the ever-present missiles on alert, we won the Cold War. But no one won the Cold War, I would argue, and there were thousands of losers and even fatalities in our own country. Up until 1995, according to the researcher Stephen Swartz, uh, Schwartz, who published a massive study of the subject, he said $4 trillion was spent on nuclear weapons since the end of World War II. Today, that number can be roughly doubled, $8 billion over the last 70 years. The United States spent this to produce 27,000 nuclear warheads, most of which have now been eliminated. Uh, thousands of nuclear weapons workers died from their job site radiation exposures. McClatchy, the third biggest newspaper chain in the country now, spent a year doing this investigative report, and their lowball estimate was that over 33,000 U.S. nuclear weapons workers died from their on-site radiation exposures. Their survivors might take issue with this uh, claim of having won the Cold War. Another group of survivors who might take issue with the allegation is this group of survivors of some 16,000 U.S. citizens who were used without their consent in human radiation experiments. These were made public in the 90s during the Clinton administration uh, with the help of a lot of prodding by researchers from New Mexico. If you want to see more about these particular experiments, the textbook is Plutonium Files. It's an excellent compendium of what was done here. Hazel O'Leary, the Secretary of Energy, who helped declassify many of these previously secret documents, said the first thing she thought of when she saw these reports were uh, the Nazi doctors whose experiments in the death camps produced law after the war that made all this sort of experimentation unlawful. And yet it was done by our own research scientists in universities and government hospitals. According to this 1997 report by the National Institutes of Health, radioactive fallout from our open-air bomb tests gave thyroid cancer to as many as 75,000 U.S. citizens. Uh, some 15% of this number of thyroid cancers will have been fatal cases of cancer as well. So these people, again, have reason to argue that the U.S. was a loser in the Cold War. Well, as I said, the publication of the first book brought about lots of protests. On the far right here is the late Sam Day, our founder, whose idea it was to bring these missiles to public attention. This is a picture taken at the new Minuteman Missile National Historic Site, where you too can sit in this chair and do a simulated launch of a Minuteman missile for free. And it's really, a, it's really an interesting place. Uh, it's right on Interstate 90 with a big sign, so it's easy to get to. Last summer, 100,000 people visited this park. And they're treated to this nostalgic uh, treatment of the Air Force as heroes and victors, and if you look really, really hard, at the very end of the tour, you're reminded, oh, there still are 450 missiles out there on alert. This is myth-making that's going on, as I said, all over the country. There's a Ronald Reagan missile historic site in North Dakota. Rocky Flats has been turned into a recreational area, the former plutonium pit production site, which is highly contaminated. There are a dozen of these uh, historic sites outlined in the book where the government is trying to convince us that nuclear weapons are a thing of the past. I've got a few slides of some of the dozens of protests that have taken place in the missile fields, and the uh, Omaha-based Strategic Air Command was also the target of a lot of protests because that's where the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff does its work year-round to choose the targets for the remaining nuclear warheads in the arsenal. They work in an office six stories underground underneath the Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha there. And uh, hundreds of people have protested at this base and at the silos and have served dozens of years in incarcerated for the trespass convictions that inevitably result here. Sometimes, I shouldn't say inevitably, because sometimes things change. We celebrated Martin Luther King Day uh, many years before it was made a national holiday and always uh, quoting his statements about nuclear weapons and war. Oh, and just to uh, take the shine off of any, uh, any thought you might have that prison is a real bummer and nobody should ever go there, 
Uh, I've made lifelong friends. This is the Duluth prison camp where I did a six-month stretch in 2006. And there used to be a U.S. air base. So I walk in there, and it's got this facility like an air base and a huge music program. And I found a trumpet right away the first day. And uh, they had lots of musical instruments and practice rooms, pianos, everything. So I'm in a practice room by myself playing this horn, and the big man in the middle there to my left, outweighing me by maybe four times, was Big Charles O'Neill. He, he shows up at the door of this practice room. He was filling up the whole doorway. He opened the door and said, uh, would you like to play in Big Charles' Rhythm and Blues Review? <laughs> it was my second day in this prison. You know, I said, yes, I would. <laughs> and we've, uh, we practiced every day for two hours, total escape. You know, you know, psychologically, it's like being in the studio. And we performed two concerts for the population. It's just a wonderful experience. Most recently, um, this little incident was kept secret from the Pentagon higher-ups uh, when they were out in this airbase investigating a drug scandal. They had a delegation from D.C. swooped on on Warren Air Base because there was allegations that some of the missile airs were distributing ecstasy and amphetamines to one another. I mean, this is totally understandable in my lights because what could be more tedious, more boring, more monotonous than working underground on 12-hour shifts three days at a time with nothing to do 27 years after the Cold War ended, after the Soviet threat vanished? There's no... The New York Times series on this scandal reported that there's, you know, there's no career advancement in the missile fields. If you get assigned to that duty, it's like a dead end now. So these missileers are demoralized. They're bored. They need a little amphetamine to keep from falling asleep. When this high-level delegation came out to investigate the drug scandal, this thing was being investigated. Uh, investigated. Uh, the missile indicated there was a problem. The Air Force people from Warren sent out a team. The team made the problem worse. They caused another mishap. According to the Air Force, it cost $2 million bucks to fix the damage. Uh, CBS embarrassed the Air Force here by reporting that at the time, the local Warren Air Base officers didn't inform the Pentagon that this was a problem and ongoing. So this is a report on the drug scandal, which has now expanded to include 19 people from this air base reportedly coming up on charges for distributing drugs. Another scandal you might have heard about it because it was reported heavily in 2014 uh, was a cheating on proficiency exams. These are the practice drills that the missileers have to go through so that they know the order of events to launch this missile when the order comes. They're under extreme pressure to get a perfect score. Well, we, uh, we go through in some detail a list of these scandals that have uh, rocked the, the, missile, uh, the missile field crews, which amount to about 7,600 people these days. These scandals and the accidents as I mentioned, uh, have led to calls for elimination of these missiles uh, from the nuclear weapons arsenal. Uh, this guy on the left, Chance Salzman, wrote a rather startling report in 2010 saying the whole arsenal could be reduced to 311 warheads. That could be held on one submarine. So we have 14 of the submarines. Uh, more significantly, in 2012, uh, the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, this James Cartwright, is the second highest military official in the country. It was a chair of an elite commission that concluded that the uh, entire ICBM force can be eliminated. This report said some really strong and startling things. He said, um, but we were using some of these statements from these high-ranking military officials who aren't pacifists at all, and they're not even calling for elimination of the nuclear arsenal. But they are saying this. General Cartwright said the U.S. could address military utility concerns even with the elimination of land-based missiles. The report went on to say, no sensible argument has been put forward for using nuclear weapons to solve any of the major 21st century problems we face. Now they're talking nuclear weapons in general. He said nuclear weapons have on balance become more a part of the problem than any solution. And then they got specific. 
In silos across the Midwest, land-based missiles are highly vulnerable to enemy attack. You know, you can walk right up to them and lob a little glue in there. They said eliminating these weapons would be the best option and would save $100 billion over the next three decades. President Obama could begin the phase-out before he left office. This is great news. Now, interestingly, uh, this report in 2012 was signed by then-Senator Chuck Hagel, who went on to become Secretary of Defense. For a senator to call for this, you know, that was good. Not too risky at being a senator. But when he sat in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee for his confirmation hearings as Secretary of Defense, there's quite a few people on that committee who represent those states. They like that money coming in to their states, all the military contracts, all the jobs and the better roads that involve uh, maintaining these weapons. So they are fighting for these weapons, and they were grilling Mr. Hagel on his signing this report. But Hagel stuck to his position and uh, won his confirmation. He didn't back down in front of the committee. And most recently, uh, Clinton's Secretary of Defense here, William Perry, has called for the same thing, and he's done so repeatedly, uh, both in public speeches about his new book and uh, recently in an op-ed on the New York Times uh, opinion page, September 30th. He said, ICBMs aren't necessary, they're not needed, they're simply too easy to launch on bad information. <laughs> this is scary. And would be the most likely source of an accidental nuclear war. He referred to them as destabilizing. He said, they don't provide for our security, they endanger it. Well, these voices of reason, as I would call them, are being hampered. And this group of eight senators is currently foiling all these attempts to get rid of these Cold War relics. Senators who have interest in these big military bases and the contracts and the billions of dollars that come into their states. So they think of them strictly as job programs and guaranteed votes and aren't interested in arms control that would affect that money. A good example is in 2012, a Russian proposal to cut another 400 warheads from the active arsenal, down to 1,550 warheads that are currently on submarines, bombers, and these missiles ready to go on a moment's notice. Well, this 400 warhead reduction is imminently reasonable, and yet it was halted and failed because of the work of Montana's Senator Max Baucus. Max Baucus complained that the cut would have meant closing one of these three missile bases. He said, probably mine as if the one in Montana were his missile base. Well, Bill Hartung of the Center for Responsive Politics found that same year, 2012, that these 10 senators got at least $513,000 from the four largest missile contractors in campaign contributions, General Electric, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and United Technologies. So the corruption is just as thick as molasses, and it has nothing to do with national defense anymore. These senators need to take a lesson from the late Paul Nietzsche. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? He was uh, Reagan's hawkish, anti-communist uh, national security advisor for many years during the Reagan administration. He oversaw the buildup of 17,000 new nuclear weapons that were produced under Reagan. But after he retired, he completely reversed his position and denounced the theory of deterrence itself. I'd like to read. I have a handout on this. Oh, in the back of the room, uh, we produced at NukeWatch a brochure that collects a lot of these statements from retired military officials who renounce nuclear weapons after their pension is secure. And this is a principal, one of those former hawks. He said... In a New York Times op-ed, I see no compelling reason why the U.S. should not unilaterally get rid of its nuclear weapons. To maintain them adds nothing to our security. I can think of no circumstances under which it would be wise for the U.S. to use nuclear weapons, even in retaliation for their prior use against us. And this is a great insight that a lot of people don't understand. If you use nuclear weapons against a so-called opponent, the fallout is going to recoil against you. And your own people, like with bomb testing, bomb building, kills your own people. It, it's inevitable because the wind blows fallout, 
and there's no controlling it. He went on to say that our conventional military forces are so overwhelming that nuclear weapons are redundant. We've seen proof of this by the invasion, bombardment, takeover of Afghanistan and Iraq, all done without nuclear weapons. So I would like to think of Paul Nietzsche's denunciation as an epitaph from the nuclear arsenal, and if we can just repeat it enough in the right places and raise the volume, I think we can see the elimination, not just of these nuclear weapons in the ground, but the bombers and submarines too. Uh, it's a long haul campaign, as many of the people in this room already know. And it's going to take a lot of sacrifice, I think. The same sort of sacrifice that military people are willing to make when they sign up for duty. We've got we to pay some personal price to confront this corruption which is so deeply seeded into the economic system of the country. Uh, you know, there's contractors making parts for these weapons in every congressional district. So all these congressional reps have an interest in expanding the military budget beyond what its enormous size already is. We need to confront this and uh, not take no for an answer. Well, it's 10 after 8. I'd be happy to take some questions with folks. Uh, and there is a mic for phone here. Uh, for questions, if you don't mind coming up to ask a question, then I don't have to repeat it for everybody. We'll save a little time. Yeah. Are, are, how familiar are, are you with the Trident system, the submarines? And uh, are you familiar that we have a secret massive base here in Mare Island where they repair melted down Trident submarines on a regular basis, just not far from here? Thanks for the question. Um, We've done a lot of research and reporting and direct action against the Trident submarine system. The two bases that I'm aware of are at Bangor, Washington on the west coast and at Kings Bay, Georgia on the east coast. Uh, but of course, obviously there are repair places. Oh, I didn't know about that at all. Uh, a repair site in San Francisco Bay? Oh, I didn't know about that. That's a good, uh, a good tip for research. There's lots of places like this. The Santa Susana reactor site outside L.A. is virtually unknown, and they had four reactor meltdowns there with experimental nuclear reactors in the 60s. Um, the Trident submarines in Bangor, Washington, you know, move weapons, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, from the shore to the subs and back and forth on a regular basis, which is risky movement. And uh, most recently, the people watchdogging that, the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolence, they tried to get a hold of emergency response plans in the event of an accident like your friend underwent with these missiles because the military has to have emergency response plans and uh, provide them to the county, and then the county is supposed to make them public. And when the county was going to turn over these evacuation plans to this watchdog group, the Navy objected and went to court and tried to prevent it, uh, indicating how afraid the Navy is of public information about the dangers of its own system. You know? So that's why, for example, I hadn't heard of this repair site in San Francisco Bay. They like secrets. Uh, how many uh, nuclear warheads do you think there are now in the world, uh, U.S. and Russia? And um, how many of those are redundant now? And how many would be replaced if they had the money or what the money was approved? What are they doing about deciding which ones are to be replaced and, and, uh, and why and so forth? I have this fact sheet on the current nuclear weapons arsenals of the world. As you can see, most countries have very, very few nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia and the U.S. have the majority of deployed, ready-to-use warheads. You can see we have many, many in storage or being kept warm and ready to use that aren't uh, on alert status. The U.S. about 7,000, Russia a few more. So calls by <clears throat> countries of the global south and the non-line movement for complete abolition, uh, they're being taken seriously now, and it wouldn't be that hard to accomplish if the U.S. and Russia would just agree to it <laughs> because uh, everybody else has very few weapons. Uh, North Korea is not on this list uh, because the speculation about how many they have between three and ten warheads all comes from the CIA, so I don't think it's worth even reporting. <laughs> yeah, John Pilger, the uh, famous uh, 
a documentary filmmaker, has been writing a lot lately about the arms race, and he's been speaking and saying that uh, the uh, that we're not being told what the budget for our arms are now, and that it's been majorly increased under the Obama administration. I'd like to know if you have any comment on that. Oh, yeah, John Pilger is reporting on this 2014 proposal by the Obama administration to completely rebuild the nuclear weapons infrastructure, a new plutonium production facility at Los Alamos, New Mexico, a new uranium uh, nuclear weapons jacket is what they call it, or the secondary, at the Y-12 site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then the non-nuclear components being built at the Kansas City plant. And that plant's already been completely finished, and they're doing those non-nuclear parts there, much to the consternation of the local peaceniks who tried to prevent that. Uh, yeah, the government of Obama wants to spend $300 billion every 10 years for 30 years rebuilding the infrastructure so that they can produce 80 new nuclear weapons warheads every year. Uh, this has not been approved yet by Congress. It'll bankrupt the country. It, we can't afford it. And it would mean hundreds of tons of new radioactive waste as well. So there's no reason by why the people should roll over for that and let this happen. Uh, the, it's a perfect time to completely wind down the nuclear weapons era instead of this proposal by Obama to get it restarted. There's a documentary premiering tomorrow to, at the right show right the called Command and Control. Is, do, you, uh, do you recommend it? Is it, uh, is it, uh, is it on the same wavelength or...? or? Oh, yes, uh, that's going to premiere here in town tomorrow, right? Yes. Command and Control is a film version of Eric Schlosser's award-winning study, Command and Control, that came out in 2012, I think, about nuclear weapons accidents in the United States, uh, one in particular. But he does chronicle quite a few of the nuclear weapons incidents that have led to major uh, pollution problems. I think he's in town for the premiere. Yes. Uh, John, can you say something about the international situation uh, with the, the ban on nuclear weapons? Yes, there is a terrific uh, international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. You might have heard of ICAN, I-C-A-N dot O-R-G. It's a relatively new campaign to uh, establish a treaty that, like the treaty ban on landmines or biological weapons, chemical weapons, it would ban the production manufacture, possession, and use of nuclear weapons. And the campaign is having some great success at the United Nations, uh, most recently having won an agreement among the, uh, the first committee at the UN to bring to the General Assembly a motion to have negotiations brought underway for negotiations in good faith to abolish nuclear weapons or what the Non-Proliferation Treaty obliges the U.S. to accomplish. Uh, we're a signatory principal signer to that treaty, along with a lot of the other nuclear weapon states and, of course, 150 states that don't have nuclear weapons. The uh, U.S. and the other nuclear powers are dragging their feet on this negotiation and trying to prevent it from going ahead. They think that their own uh, diplomatic efforts are good enough, but I can, and the rest of the world uh, realized that you know, 60 years since the non-proliferation treaty was signed without any progress indicates that there's no good faith uh, on the part of the nuclear powers to proceed with these negotiations. So they're pushing this on their own. And uh, so I encourage you to check out the website, ICANN.org. Their information is really excellent. They have fine uh, video and uh, still information about the uh, campaign and how we can be part of it. I wonder whether uh, that was very publicized when I was in Iraq after shock and awe. It was horrendous, the nuclear, uh, the, the, the depleted uranium mm -hmm. and the effect it had on the children. Mm -hmm. They were malformed, crippled. It, mm -hmm. it was not publicized here, but I went to the hospitals and I could not believe my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think if we would eliminate nuclear weapons or maybe all weapons, we would have free education, we would have free health care <laughs> in this country, and we might even get educated. It's a very good point on depleted uranium. If you're not familiar with the phrase depleted uranium, the U.S. has about 700,000 tons of uranium-238 left over as waste 
from the manufacture of fuel for reactors and the cores for nuclear weapons. This waste is extremely hard, and it's been found to penetrate armor, armor plate, better than anything else, better than tungsten, which was the previous uh, best metal for this. So the material is given away free to arms manufacturers who have been turning it into shells, anti-tank weapons, and then smaller 30-millimeter uh, shells. And as the questioner said, uh, the U.S. used massive amounts of it in the 2001 war on Iraq. 360 metric tons were fired into southern Iraq. Another 170 tons in 2003. It was used in Panama City for the first time in 1998 when Bush Sr. bombed Panama City. But then in Kosovo, Afghanistan, the U.S. has been experimenting with this radioactive toxic weapon for decades now. And we have seen an enormous increase in childhood birth or abnormalities in southern Iraq because when this material smashes through tank armor or armor plate, it turns to powder and dust, and then it can be spread on the wind hundreds of miles. But it contaminates the soil, the water, vegetation, basically forever. It's very difficult to clean up. Again, there's an international campaign to see this weapon banned by treaty, it's the International Campaign to Ban Uranium Weapons, ICBUW. They have a terrific website, and their campaign is also having some success at the UN to see uh, not just this weapon banned, like landmines, but to make sure that uh, countries like the U.S. that have used it are held responsible for cleaning up the effects after a conflict is over, including dealing with the uh, terrible health effects in southern Iraq and elsewhere. Yeah, good evening. Mm -hmm. I am a veteran of the U.S. Army, and I have to tell you, I was in a nuclear battalion of the Lance Missile type mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, uh, nuclear uh, launch. Uh, and I was stationed in Kralsheim, Germany, where, you know, the, the, the battalion was the 2nd and 42nd FA at McKee Barracks. And luckily, uh, I checked that unit is not anymore i want to uh, you know seeing the documentary the the, the 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 photos and information you uh put uh, it remind me you know as a flashback uh, of the corruption i mean uh, there was a you know in uh, magia army base there was a lot of drug trafficking i mean we didn't have anything to do but fight among each other i mean i came out of there affected with ptsd uh, to this day uh, but i learned from those experiences uh, uh it made me grow politically because i start questioning the world you know uh, the army is uh, an institution that is so racist so sexist that i you know my own experience within start to make me think about it and obviously uh back then the green party in germany was in the great it was a grassroots movement not not what it has become and they <laughs> picked our base and uh, that made me conscious about you know something was wrong in the world definitely mm -hmm. and uh after i got out of the army i went to college and i learned uh you know socialist politics and i became obviously a different person but uh, uh, and I'm, you know, very much aware of the dangers of uh, war and weaponry, and uh, you know uh, how militarism can affect uh, young people's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if it would have not been because I have become a socialist and I, my life got another purpose, I could not tell you how my life would have been destroyed by the U.S. military because, uh, you know, I, and luckily I had good parents and a good community that helped me out throughout the years. But uh, certainly, I mean, I thank you for, you know, all the education you are giving us tonight. And uh, nuclear weapons are definitely a, a danger that can wipe out humanity. And I think we have to uh, create conscious and become more, become more active because as long as they're here and there, they can destroy humanity. And we cannot let to the capitalist, insane rulers of this world to uh, get, you know, destroy uh, humankind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What do you think the uh, 
state of a nuclear arms race is going to be. Russia seems Russia seems to be uh, deploying more missiles. Well, Marion. Huh. I mean, I want to point out that in the German peace movement, um, we see Syria as a sovereign uh, sovereign country, and Russia is invited to be there. I'm still against all bombings, even though if it's against the I- IS, I also see you know bombings always cause uh, so-called collateral damage, and this is the citizens. But uh, all the other, um, yeah. NATO allies who are bombing there, they are not invited. So that shows what really makes the problem in this region. And it's about to overthrow a country, you know, to get more people under control. And the same is, um, for example, there was a promise when we had the unification in in Germany in 1990 that uh, when Russia took their arms away, out of former Eastern Germany, their nuclear weapons and so on. There was this promise that NATO wouldn't go closer to Russia. They wouldn't go into Eastern European countries, Mm -hmm. but they did. They moved 1,000 kilometers uh, forward. And and when we see all the NATO uh, exercises they Mm -hmm. are doing, um, and we just had in uh, June when the NATO summit took place in Poland, uh, just next to the Russian border, they had mm-hmm. 31,000 NATO troops, you know, having nuclear exercise in Poland. It's, it's, uh, that is something what really steers up the, the problem. So, and uh, for sure, all nuclear countries, they modernize uh, their nuclear arms. But we know that after the Cold War, um, Russia was giving a strong signal that uh, they didn't want to go on with uh, nuclear arms and, and others and limited it down to 4% of what uh, NATO was doing. The top of NATO is the US. They really uh, expanded it. So... And that's why a lot of in the peace movement, they even ask for, you know, Germany has to leave NATO, not to be Hmm. part of this whole thing. Um, Yeah, thank you. Good point. Well, I think we'll wrap this up, but we really want to thank John. Maybe you'll hang around for a little bit. Yeah, the Nuke Watch uh, website is nukewatchinfo.org. We have a Facebook page as well. Thank you very much.